This is Up Close. I'm Stephen I. Weiss. Finding empathy with those who've suffered from violence can be a task for individuals and for entire communities. This April marks the 100th anniversary of the Armenian Genocide, an act that's still not recognized as such by Congress, the White House, Israel, or many Jewish organizations. But the parallels between the Armenian American experience and the Jewish American experience are quite strong. From summer camp to questions of how to deal with a legacy of being victimized by collective violence. Melinette Tumani discusses her memoir, There Was and There Was Not. And for Bergen Record columnist Mike Kelly, coming to understand the legacy of terrorist violence, led him to examine the lives of two young American Jews killed in a bus bombing nearly 20 years ago in Jerusalem. We discuss his book, The Bus on Jaffa Road. But first, here's my interview with Melina Tumani, whose book was recently nominated for a National Book Critics Circle Award. Your book has generated uh, some protest and even conspiracy theories that, uh, that Turkey and Israel have funded your work. How could your, how could your book become so controversial uh, in, in such a way? Although I am surprised by some of the particular criticisms, such as that one, I'm not surprised that it's controversial. And that's because there really hasn't been any tradition in the Armenian community of publishing or sort of outwardly to the non-Armenian world presenting ideas that um, deviate from a very specific path. And that path is uh, Turkey committed a genocide in 1915 and Turkey must recognize the genocide. Now, nothing I say in this book goes against the fact that Turkey, and it, and it is a fact, the fact that, that Ottoman Turkey committed a genocide in 1915. And likewise, I, I believe that this genocide needs to be recognized, not only by Turkey, but you know by anybody who's writing about it or commenting on it. However, I wanted to explore the ways in which this um, single-minded focus on the genocide issue had affected the Armenian diaspora on a psychological level, on an intellectual level. And to do that, I have to go into a lot of uh, lines of reflection and thinking that are not entirely comfortable for people. Um, so it's not surprising to me that some of that has uh, been threatening and been received as, as you know, dangerous. Right, and within your, uh, what, what you're doing here, it's, it's predictable that someone who's second generation, well, relatively assimilated American, Armenian, uh, generation would begin producing works that would seriously upset some of the older generations and some of the diehards in the community. You, you right? might think it would be predictable, but it's actually not predictable at all. In fact, um, one of the things that got me so interested in the topic was that I saw that within my own generation, um, you know, from childhood onward through my adulthood, you know, up till now, I see that it's my own peers that are in some ways the most um, single-minded on this issue. And there's a level of, um, there's a level of clinging to the cause of genocide recognition that seems to be serving a larger purpose, which, which has to do with upholding community identity, upholding individual identity as having had this, this tragic history and all of that. And um, in no way does the moving forward in time away from 1915 turn out to mean that people will be less interested in or less kind of committed to this as an activist cause. Um, so that that is actually part of what moved me to dive deeper into it. It was fascinating to me throughout the book to see how much there was a parallel to Jewish experience in in just so many ways and uh, and so for example tell me about Armenian youth camp uh, that you went to in New Jersey yes um, several of my Jewish friends have told me that they they understood exactly what I was describing about camp um, this was a camp that I went to uh, for five summers from age 11 to 15 um, in Massachusetts and it was the thing I looked forward to all year long I mean it was the best Thing in my life as a child. I just enjoyed every second. Uh, but a lot of what we did there was sort of very actively, overtly reinforcing our uh, commitment to our Armenian identity. And um, sometimes this would take the form of, you know, dancing or language classes. But, you know, there were also history classes and debates. Um, and and uh, one of the things that I talk about in the book is uh, one particular year when we had something called debate night, we had um, a guest speaker who came and basically talked to us about whether uh, what essentially amounts to suicide bombing is 
uh, a just way to seek uh, recognition and justice for the Armenian genocide. And these were things that really brought us together. But as I got older, I didn't see it in quite the same way anymore. And now Mike Kelly discusses the legacy of a bombing on a bus on Jaffa Road. So you cover northern New Jersey. And one story that you probably didn't expect to be following you throughout your career was a story of terrorism in Jerusalem. Right. But, but surprisingly, uh, it has kind of been this, this thread in your career. Sure, certainly since 9-11. I mean, uh, I, like many of us who, who were working that day, we had no idea what we were entering into when we heard that two planes had just crashed into the World Trade Center. But as I look back on my career, I have written here and there about terrorism, not knowing what the full implications were. But 9-11 was very much a turning point for me. And that's when I, I started to cover terrorism in a, in a much more substantial way, still having no idea that it would lead me to Jaffa Road in downtown Jerusalem. But you'd already in 1996 been covering this episode where uh, a northern New Jersey uh, woman uh, and her boyfriend of, of several years mm -hmm. were, uh, were killed in a bus bombing in Jerusalem. That's right. Yeah. Uh, when Sarah Duker was killed, um, she is from Teaneck, New Jersey, a, a local woman, uh, and we, we immediately jumped on the story as any good local newspaper would. I remember going to her house that day, uh, or soon, a soon after she was killed, and I wrote a column about it, uh, basically focusing on the irony. Sarah had written some essays uh, that basically spoke to her sympathy toward the Palestinians and how much she would like to see the Pal Israeli-Palestinian conflict resolved. And I thought, how ironic, you know, here was a young woman who had who had some empathy for the Palestinian cause, and yet here she was killed by the most radical elements of that cause. And some of the people you speak to, you speak to the, I guess, terrorist mastermind sure. is, is the word that would be used uh, behind this bombing and, and a number of other terrorist acts, and asked them why. I had always been under the assumption when suicide bombings took place that they were the work of perhaps one deranged individual and how wrong I was. I, I ended up getting a report by the United States State Department on this particular bombing and it showed a number of Palestinian suspects, one of whom was in jail. His name was Hassan Salameh. So I called up the Israelis and I said, could I interview this guy? And after much back and forth, they said yes. The book begins with this interview uh, where I ask him, do you know the name Sarah Duker? And oddly enough, he said yes, in perfect English. And then I said simply, why did you kill her? And I really, and I did that deliberately because I wanted to focus on the personal here. You know, one of the, one of the problems with the way we in the media cover terrorism today is that we cover it as a body count. A bomb goes off somewhere in the world and we say X number of people were killed and the second paragraph of the story is usually such and such a group claims responsibility and then maybe the third or fourth paragraph gets into the diplomatic or political implications of this. But we don't realize that in the lives of, of ordinary people, you know, they've lost a son or a daughter or a mother, a father, or aunt and uncle. And I wanted to drill down on the personal aspect of this story. That's all for this week's podcast episode of Up Close. A reminder, you can see the full episode of Up Close on the Jewish Channel on cable. The Jewish Channel is available on cable. Time Warner Cable Channel 1640, Iowa Link Channel 505, RCN Channel 268, Cox Cable Channel 1, Bright House Channel 330, Verizon Fios Channel 900, and on Comcast on the on-demand menu on premium channels. For more information, visit TJCTV.com.